physics worship. <clears throat> and a bunch of um, uh, real um, popular Christians are getting into that. And what it is is they're reaching a certain level in the physical realm. Uh, it's a tone. And they tell you, don't sing all the old songs anymore. Don't sing any songs. Just pick three words and just start concentrating on those three words, and it'll take you into a quantum physic worship. That is very demonic. It's very dangerous. So don't have anything to do with that kind of stuff. Okay, if you start seeing that being circulated among a lot of the apostolic reformation movement with Cindy Jacobs and all of that stuff, don't fall for that garbage. The, uh, the apostolic reformation, don't, don't, fall, don't follow that stuff. It's a bunch of garbage. <clears throat> Probably get some flack from that, but that's too bad. I'm used to flack, so maybe they can call me Bob Flack. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, and I hope you do because you came to Bible study, if you don't have your Bibles, that's good because we'll have it up on the screen for you. Um, and uh, pray for those who you don't see today. Maybe they're not feeling well or just exhausted, tired, and, you know, and uh, I tell you, it's good to be in God's house, isn't it? Amen. You know, many of us struggle, many of us, many of us go through battles, but we're here today, and, and so I'm glad to see you here tonight. So we're going to be talking about Lesson 12 tonight on biblical hermeneutics, on how to interpret the Bible. We've been going through this series for a number of weeks now, and uh, let me tell you, this stuff is very seldom taught. You don't see this in Bible studies too much anymore. You don't, in fact, some, you don't even see too much Bible study going on. You hear a lot of stories and a lot of things, but real good, solid Bible studies. Uh, I believe that we need to go back to the old paths. Amen? And Jeremiah 16 says that. I believe 16 says that. You know, return to the old paths. Nothing wrong with the old paths. Amen? Praise God. Lesson 12 tonight is the ethic, eth ethnic division principle. <clears throat> what is the Ethnic division principle of biblical interpretation. Well, the ethnic division principle is the principle by which the interpretation of any particular passage of Scripture is determined upon the consideration of God's appointed ethnic divisions. In other words, there's, there's different ethnic divisions in the Bible. There's Jews and there's Gentiles, and we're going to be talking about that. You have a question? No, Lesson 12. Isn't it Lesson 12? Oh, it's Lesson 13? Okay, but in my, my book, it's Lesson 12. But we'll, we'll, for the sake of argument, it's Lesson 13, if you have your book, okay? So number two, what are the key ethnic divisions that have primary influence on biblical interpretation? Well, first of all, if you look at throughout the Bible, you're going to see there's terms used in the Bible that refer to different groups of people. Okay, number one, you'll, you'll see that it's referenced as just plain people. You'll see that in Genesis 28.3. I'm just going to give you some, some here that are probably in your book. Uh, 28.3, um, Joshua chapter 4, verse 24. And <clears throat> mine is the teacher's manual, so um, it may be a little bit different, but we're going to cover the same subjects. Number two, you'll see how it's relevant to households. Joshua 7.14, you'll see that. If you see that in your book, just, just highlight that scripture to look it up later on. I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll read that for you because I have it right here. It says, In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord, shall take, uh, the Lord takes shall come according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall, cover by, shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. So there's divisional different groups of people. And you'll see where the scripture talks about families. Genesis 10.32, 1 Chronicles 16.28, Psalms 96.7, and Jeremiah 2.4. And I'm going to read Jeremiah 2.4 for you. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. So it talks about a house or a family or a unit. And then, of course, it talks about tribes, and we see that in Joshua 11.23. I'll read that to you. 
So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. Then the land rested from war. So God has different ways of dealing with different people in the Bible. And that's why when you go to interpret a passage of Scripture, know the kind of ethnic background or, or household or people he was talking to. You know, a lot of times, and I hear this a lot too, uh, you probably heard it many, many times. Uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, right? You heard that before, right? Okay, give me some, give me some feedback so I know you're, you're still alive, okay? All right. So if you read that, he says, you shall what? Call upon me and I will heal your land, right? He says, if my what? People. Well, who's he talking about? Is he talking about the church? Okay, well, who's he talking to? Okay, but what's the specifics of that scripture? See, we're going to get into that because don't forget, there was a time when the kingdom of Israel was together as one, but then it was a time when the kingdom was split in two. So there's times when he's talking to Israel, which is the ten tribes, and then he's talking to Judah, which is the two or three tribes that were with Judah. So you have to know which king was in, was in power and who was talking to who, what prophet was talking where. Otherwise, if you don't know that, you'll get mixed up. How many ever get mixed up sometimes? You say, oh, is it First Kings Chronicles is talking? To, it's all over the place. Okay. Uh, if you like to know chronological order of the Bible, there's a what's called, I think the guy's name is Reese. He wrote a book called The Chronological Bible. Excellent Bible. I have it in my study right here if you want to take a look at it. It, it puts all of Kings, 2 Kings, 1 King, uh, First Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, all of those books in order. All of the chapters, how they follow in order. So it's a really good uh, thing to read through. Also, different languages. Now, how many know that God can speak all different languages? God can speak Nigerian. He can speak Arabian. He can speak Palestinian. He can speak French. He can speak English. He can speak any language that's out there. And there are three groups of classes of people, and this is important for you to understand because it helps you to interpret the Bible correctly. I hear a lot of people quote scriptures, <clears throat> excuse me, but when they quote them, they're quoting them out of context. When you quote a scripture out of context, you can build any kind of biblical doctrine or teaching you want to. You can make it say anything you want it to say. And a lot of people do that. They take scripture and they make it say anything they want to say. Um, but you have to remember that at times, God's speaking to a specific people at a specific time. And we can learn from those things, like the Bible says. They are there for our learning, for our admonition, for our example. Yes, we can learn from those things. But we can't take away from the original letter when it was written and to whom it was written to. And so these three groups of people, you're going to find them in uh, 1 Corinthians 10.32. And I'm going to ask if uh, our great person that's running the video for all this time has done such a great job. And I, I appreciate you, brother Jesse, for doing that. You do a great job every Wednesday night. <clears throat> Look at this scripture here. It says, give, now Paul is talking here, and he says, give none offense neither to the, the Jews, okay, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Why were they called Jews? Okay, Here, this, that's a good question to ask yourself when you read these kind of things. Of course, people, you know, they told me I'm kind of analytical, but I like being analytical because it helps me to understand more. Why does it say Jews? Why not Hebrews? Abraham was called a Hebrew because he was from Hebron, and that's where the Hebrew name came from. The Jews, the name Jews came from those that were 
of the diaspora or those that came back out of bondage from Babylon, and they were called Jews because they came from the tribes of Judah. Now see, if you don't know that, you get them all mixed up. Okay, so you have neither offense to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, and we all know who they are, that's us, right? You're a Gentile, right? Okay, I want to make sure I, I didn't hear you, so, okay. And then, not to the church of God. So you see three entities there. You see the Jews, you see the Gentiles, and the church of God. So when they tell you that it doesn't make any difference, it does. <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example. When you're trying to understand biblical eschatology, anybody know what eschatology is? Huh? Biblical eschatology is study of the last days, things in the last times, during the, the end times. Okay. If you read Matthew 24, okay, when Jesus is talking and he says, when you see these things happen, flee to Judea. So, does that mean that everybody in the church that's there that sees these things happening has to get on a plane and go to Israel and flee to Judea? Why not? It's in the Bible. No, but it's in the Bible. We should believe everything in the Bible, right? It's in the Bible. Well, yeah, it's in the Bible, but it's for a specific per person, people, at a specific time. So when you interpret that scripture in Matthew 24 about fleeing to Judea, you have to ask the question, what is the time element he's talking about? And if he's talking about the time of the tribulation, and here's where people get off, okay, and they say, well, that's for us, and that, that proves the church is here during the tribulation period, okay, and I tell them, well, that's a misinterpretation. You're, you're putting meaning into the scripture because it's not meant for the Christian. He's not talking to the Christian. He's talking to the Jews, and he's telling them to flee to Judea when you see this time. Why? Because it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time of the tribulation period. All of that you have to take into account and into an effect when you're reading that scripture. Because the church is no longer here. So again, what can we learn from that? Well, we can learn one thing, that if you're not right with God and you stay behind, then you better you know, flee somewhere. <laughs> So that's how you look at Scripture. You've got to look at the time element. You've got to look at who they were talking to, at what specific time they were talking to, and, and what was the application of what was Jesus trying to convey there. Amen? Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at the Gentiles for a moment. The term Gentiles is used in the Bible to refer to those who are outside of the covenant of God. Gentiles were outside of the covenant of God. Everyone believe that? Amen. Some other terms that are used in the Bible to reference this group of people include the heathen. Right? Remember, uh, what was her name there on Stanford and Son? Aunt Esther? Remember? Oh, you bunch of heathens. Right? <clears throat> she used to use the word heathens. Right? Okay. It's funny you're laughing because you all remember that, don't you? <clears throat> the heathens, the lost, the nations, the uncircumcised, foreigners, aliens, strangers. But there is a very good summary of the ethnic divisions found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. And I'm going to ask you to put that up to Ephesians 2, 11 to 12. But put it up in the NLT version for me. It says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You ever feel like an outsider? Oh, 
before you felt like an outsider for whatever reason. You were an outsider because you were outside of the providence and the covenants of God and the promises. He says, you were called uncircumcised heathens. Now, let me ask you this. In today's society, in today's church that is around, if you call people uncircumcised heathens, how many people do you think would be in your church? Come on, somebody. Okay. But this is what God's telling Paul to write to the Ephesian church. He says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. Now you know the Jews were what? Those that were from Judea. Who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. Verse 12. Now watch this. In those days, what days was, was that? Huh? What days? Pastor Tom, you said something what? Right, in the days that they were living, alienated from God, circumcised heathens, right? In those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded, say the word excluded, not included, excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. What are we telling people today that are not saved? Huh? We're preaching a different gospel. But right, but they, they are without hope. You have to first show them their condition so that they can see their condition and repent. See, that's why Jesus, when he preached the gospel to the woman at the well, she started coming on, you know, and telling him all this stuff, all this good stuff and everything. And he said, go call your husband. Now, wait a minute. Jesus is getting a little too pushy and a little too personal there. Is he? No. Why? Because he wanted her to see something. And he said, go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. And he said, that you have spoken correctly because the last five you had were not your husband and the one you're living with is not your husband. And she says, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she does the thing that many of us do when the, when the limelight is thrown upon us. She said, you say that we worship in this mountain. <laughs> Change the subject completely. Why? Because of conviction. There's no conviction in preaching today. There's no conviction because we don't tell people their condition. We need to tell them their condition so that they can realize that they need a Savior. See, the Bible says the law is perfect, converting the soul. How come we don't preach law? We all preach grace, 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 grace. How come we're not preaching the law? Because the, the law is a schoolmaster, the Bible says, that leads to Christ. What's the law? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Because when you preach the law, it brings conviction. It does the job it's supposed to do. Because you're showing people where their condition is. So this is what I'm talking about. Ethnic divisions. People in the world out, that are outside the covenants of God, outside Christ, the Bible says they're without God. So please stop talking to, uh, talking to you know, believers. When you're with believers, stop talking like unbelievers are saved. They're not saved. They don't have God. I don't care if they go to church seven days a week. They can go to church all the time that they want to. But if they're not born again, if they're not, they're not, they don't have the spirit of Christ living in them, 
They are not a Christian. They're, they're, they're uh, heathens. <laughs> they're separated from God. They're outside the covenant relationships and promises of God. They're without God and without hope. And you've got to tell them that. You've got to tell them they're without hope. Hallelujah. Yes. <coughs> well, that's one of the big things that Right, that's one of the big things today. Who are you to judge? You say I have every right to judge according to scripture. No, that's not what the scripture says. That's what they say. Okay? Here's a good example of misinterpretation, because that's what we're talking about, interpretation tonight. Okay? I talked to somebody about that. Because they said, judge not lest you be judged. I think it's Matthew chapter 6 or 7, around there somewhere. Okay? But read the context of that scripture. What's the context of that? What I say to the person that says that, don't judge lest you be judged. I'll say, okay, what's the context of that scripture? Most people don't know. The context of that scripture is this. If you go back and you read it, you'll see that right after Jesus says that, he says, you hypocrite. You want to take the, 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 the speck out of your brother's eye, but you got a beam in your own. So it's talking about a hypocrite that's doing the same thing that they're doing and judging them. But there are people that are not doing what they're doing and can judge them. Hello? That was only specific for the people that were hypocrites. They're over there telling you, you can't do this, and yet behind the scenes they're doing it. But that doesn't mean they're not to judge. You follow what I'm saying? So when you get a chance, go back and read the context of that. You'll see that. You'll go, wow. He's talking about hypocrites. But if you're not a hypocrite and you're not doing what they do and you go and you bring correction to them and you, and you, you, you bring a judgment, then they have no right to use that scripture. Amen? Okay. When you look at the whole plan of God, Cain was the actual progenitor of the initial Gentile community. If you look at Genesis 4.16, it says this, So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So number one, you have the Gentiles. Number two, you have the children of Israel. The children of Israel were a nation that arose out of the natural seed of Abraham. Those are the children of Israel. The ones that came out of the natural seed of Abraham. Not the seed of Hagar. Where Ishmael. Abraham. They are sometimes referred to in the Bible as Hebrews. Which I had stated earlier from Hebron. That was Abraham's root culture. Very important. The Jews were from Judah and Israel. The children of Israel were chosen by God from among the nations to be his instrument in the earth to mandate his purposes to the world. Remember, they were called to be a holy people, or a holy nation, a peculiar people. The children of Israel went through different stages throughout the Old Testament age. They began, first of all, as, an, as a united nation that came forth out of Egypt. Remember that story, and, and you see that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, 34. They continued as a united nation until the death of Solomon, Kings, 1 Kings 11, 11 to 13. And after the death of Solomon, the nation or kingdom was divided into the northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah. You see that in 1 Kings 12, 20. 
Now, under Jeroboam, Israel, North, the northern kingdom, set up an alternate and idolatrous system of worship and was eventually judged by God at the hands of the Assyrians. So when you're interpreting Scripture, you've got to know if it was a divided kingdom, if it was a, a united kingdom, uh, who the judgment was for, who were the Old Testament prophets, that, and who they spoke to, because they spoke to different ones. Amos, I believe it was Amos, and Hosea spoke to Judah, and uh, some of the, uh, Jeremiah and all those spoke to Israel. So you have to know which one was speaking to whom to get the proper background information so that you can understand. And that's what, why you need to understand some of these things to understand the scriptures and understand how to interpret those scriptures. Judah in the southern kingdom experienced backsliding as well and eventually was judged by God by the hands of who? Do you remember who they were? The Babylonians. And so they were in exile with, with Babylon, Babylon and was taken into captivity. Okay, Under Ezra and Nehemiah, a remnant of people of Judah returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the temple. And however, many of them stayed in Babylon and were scattered among the nations of the world. When you read First Peter, you see, he says, uh, Peter, to the diaspora, or to those that are scattered. Your Bible says scattered, I think. But if you look up the Greek word, it's diaspora that have been dispersed. Those are the ones that were left after the Babylonian captivity. So when you get all of that information, you understand that Peter is speaking to Jewish believers. Amen? How do we know that? How do you know that? How do you know that Peter was speaking to Jewish believers? By time? Okay. Okay, this is where you pull Scripture to interpret Scripture. This is when you pull it all together. Paul says, God has sent me to the Gentile, to the, to the uncircumcision, and God has sent Peter to the circumcision, the Jew. So Peter was ministering to the Jews, and Paul was ministering to the Gentiles. So when Peter's writing First Peter, he's writing to the Christian Jews. And he's telling them, you are a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. When you understand it in the Jewish context there, what he's saying is, now that you have, re now you Jews that have become Christians, okay, now Christians and the body of Christ will be a holy priesthood, a holy nation. But that's what God originally asked you to be. But now through Jesus Christ, because you failed that, through Jesus Christ, you are going to be able to fulfill that. See, nowhere in the Bible does it teach um, re uh, replacement theology, that Israel's been replaced with the church. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that. But if you read Romans, you read chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, it talks about Israel and being able to be grafted in again, for God is able to graft them in again. So <clears throat> how many believe that God can bring the Jews back in? He's going to bring the Jews back in. So we see them mentioned as the children of, of, um, of Israel. Then in, we see them mentioned as the church. And even though the church is implied uh, in both the Old Testament and New Testament believers, its primary application is to the believers who are called out ones. Now, let me say this. There's also a doctrine called covenant theology. And you have to be careful because covenant theologists do substitute Israel for the church. In other words, anytime you read the Old Testament, it says Israel, they say you can put the word church there. That's wrong. You can't do that because you're changing the original writings. You're changing the original people who that letter uh, was written to. Now, you can take the principles of that and apply it to the church. That's not a problem. Uh, there's famous preachers that have done that. They've written articles on that and, and used that as and saying that that's the church. That's not the church. That's Israel. He's talking to Israel. Now, we can glean from that. We can learn from those things. We can, we can pick out things from that. We can see the similarities 
to that for the church, but we cannot change the original intent of the meaning. If we're doing, if we're doing that and we're changing the original content of the meaning, that means we're adding to the scripture. The Bible says not to do that. Amen? <clears throat> so both believing Jews and Gentiles together, we make up the church, which is God's chosen people, which is God's holy nation, which is a priesthood and peculiar people. In Ephesians, it talks about that you are living stones, you are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Both Israel and the church were chosen by God to be instruments and channels of his blessing to the rest of the world. Now, natural Israel failed to do that. But remember this, always remember this. The early church that first started when Jesus walked on the earth were all Jews. Right? What did Jesus say to that one that came to him? He says, I came to the Jews first. It was only after, only after, when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to have gathered you as the chick gathers her hens and bring you into my bosom, but you would not. They wouldn't. Okay. Now, we understand that from the Old Testament prophecies that the Gentiles were going to be grafted in, we were going to be allowed to come in, and thank God for that. But the early church was made up of Jewish believers, and I know there's a lot of anti-Semitism out there. That means that they're they're against they're against the Jews. They're against God, you know, God's chosen people. And as Christians, we can't be against God's people. We have to be for God's people, because God's going to graft them in again. Now, are there Jews that are atheists? Yes. Are there Jews that don't believe in God? Yes. Are there, uh, I'm sorry, are there Jews that don't believe in Messiah? Yes. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay? But that's what the tribulation period is for. Okay? It's going to sound the alarm, and many of them are going to see the truth during that period. And many of them are going to get saved. Or he's able to graft them in again. <clears throat> He's, he says that we're called peculiar people. He said, my people. And he said, they're also called the children of God. Now let me ask you this question. Is everybody in the world children of God? <coughs> okay. Let me, let me run this by you. God is their creator in that aspect. But you cannot come into a son-father relationship without covenant. And if you look at covenant, you say, well, covenant's no longer. No. If you look at a covenant, the New Testament, testament is a covenant. And what's the covenant of the New Testament? Jesus Christ came. He was the son of God. He gave his life a ransom for many. He died on that cross, shed his blood, was raised from the dead, and he made a covenant. Now, the covenant we kind of say today is the sinner's prayer. But I think that lacks a lot of the stuff. Remember I talked to you about the sacrifice cut in half and the two would walk in between them, you know, and make a covenant. <clears throat> you cannot make a covenant where there's no death. Understand that. There had to be a slaying of an animal. There had to be... You know, the cutting in half of that animal, and you had to, the blood had to be shed, and you had to walk in between them. And as you walked in between them, you made a covenant promise. Okay. So we have Jesus who makes a covenant. God makes a covenant with, with the people on the earth. 
He said, okay, I'm going to send my son. He's going to have to die, but so will you. See, there's a lot of people who think they're saved. They're not saved because they never made a covenant agreement with God. They just said a prayer. And you can tell there's no desire for God, no desire for his word, no desire for any of that. A Christian is one who makes a covenant agreement with God. Like I said, both parties have to bring the sacrifice. We don't have to bring a sacrifice of animals anymore. But there has to be a death in the covenant. So we have Jesus, we have his death, right? But then we have in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. So when you come to Jesus Christ and you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you're making a covenant to live a dead life. A changed life. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to enter into a covenant relationship with God. It's not about going to church. It's not about reading your Bible. It's not about prayer. All those things are important. But it's about making that covenant agreement, coming into covenant agreement with God and saying, okay, God, I make this covenant agreement with you. I choose Jesus Christ, and by choosing Jesus Christ, I am going to live a crucified life. I am not going to let my old man rule me and, and reign on me. I'm going to walk into this new covenant with you, and I'm going to come into agreement with you. The Bible says, how can two agree if they don't walk together in agreement? Now, that's in the book of Amos, right? Can two walk together except they be in agreement? Do you know that scripture is not talking about two people? If you read the context, it's talking about God and a, and a person. How can you walk in agreement with God if you're not uh, walk in covenant with God if you're not in agreement with him? You can. So there's going to be a lot of surprised people when the rapture comes and they're left behind because they're not walking in that covenant agreement. They're not living a crucified life. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's not about how, how, how many badges you have from Sunday school or uh, you're on a worship team or you're even preaching. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with living the crucified life. Dying daily. Putting the flesh to death every single day. The desires of the flesh every single day. Putting it to death. Living that crucified life so that you can, you can honor God with your life. He says, your body's not your own. You've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body. How do you glorify God? By keeping the covenant you made with him. Let me ask you a question. How many of you would, would really like God to break his covenant with you? No. How about if God wasn't faithful to you? But in order to have a covenant, you've got to have two in agreement. Unless two can agree, how can they walk? If two, if two, how can you walk in agreement? How can you walk together? You can't. That's why, like the Bible talks about, don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. But what does the light have to do with darkness? You can't. It, it's too, it's contrary to. So all of these things that are written in the scriptures, uh, to, to learn how to interpret the scriptures and not, not wrestle the scriptures to the point where you, you make it say what you want it to say so you can do what you want to do. The Bible's very clear about covenant relationship. And of course, there's got to be a shedding of blood. And thank God, we don't have to bring the blood of animals and goats, and the blood of goats shall not take away sin, the Bible says. So we don't do that part. God already did that by sending his son, and he shed his blood. He gave his life to make that covenant on his part sure. Now, what about your part? See, and that's what a covenant is. And that's why when we're interpreting the Bible, we've got to remember what the Bible says. Remember the former condition of the Gentiles. Before you were a Christian, <clears throat> the Bible says you were Gentiles in the flesh, uncircumcision, without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, without God in the world, far off, in enmity 
from God and man. Now, here's the present condition of the Gentiles. But now, in Christ Jesus, we're made nigh by, by then, we're made nigh by the blood of Christ. We're at peace with God and man, made one with the Jew. Middle wall of petition was broken down. The enmity was abolished, and we have one new man. Both are reconciled to God in one body, both the Jews and Gentiles, preaching of peace to those who, which were afar off, both have access to the Father because of that covenant agreement. But again, you have to know the covenant. If you don't know the covenant, how do you know? You know, we've grown up in church, right? We've been in church for years and years and years, right? And what do we hear? Come just as you are. God loves you just as you are. Well, if he loves us just the way we are, why do we have to change? Right? And that's, that's the thinking of a lot of people in churches today. They say, well, if God loves me just the way I am, then I don't have to change. I can just come to church and, and I can love God and, and I don't have to change. It's almost like a misnomer. It's like, no. God loves you and the value that he places on you as a human being. But he doesn't like what you do. In fact, he hates what you do. I asked one time people, does God hate people? Yes, he does. Read it. It's in the Word. Read it. I'm not going to tell you where they are. You're going to have to go find it. But you go and find it. You read it where he says he hates He doesn't throw sin into hell. Sinner. He says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He calls them wicked. You call people wicked today, they won't come to church. We got more unsaved people sitting in churches today, in these mega churches. There's more unsaved people in there than there are saved. Just because people gather together in a building doesn't make them the body of Christ. It makes them a club. It makes them a service, but it doesn't make them the body of Christ. What makes them the body of Christ is when they make that covenant agreement to live a crucified life, to surrender all to God and let God take over their life. Because, right, when we pray, right, we pray the sinner's prayer, right? And we pray what? Lord Jesus, I confess my sin to you. I, I'm a sinner. I need the forgiveness. Come into my life and be what? Lord and master. You know what it is to have a master? Huh? If you make that covenant agreement, the Bible says, make no, co make no promise to God. Uh, do not be rash with thy mouth in making a, a covenant. What's that, dear? Don't be hasty in making a, a rash decision. You make a covenant with God, you better keep that covenant. God doesn't take lightly people saying things and not meaning what they say. Hello? If you say you're going to serve God, then serve him. Don't, don't say, I'm going to serve God, and one day because you didn't get your way, you go back and do something else. No. You keep that covenant agreement. You say, Lord, no matter how bad it gets, I'm going to serve you. You're my Lord and Master. I'm going to listen to your voice. I'm not going to go the way of the world. I'm not going to go the way that some of these churches are going and they're trying to be like the world. I don't want to be like the world. I've had the world when I wasn't a Christian, and the world did nothing for me. It did nothing with me. It did nothing to me, but caused me to be more separated from God. I don't want anything to do with the world. The world is wicked. Those, the people are... Heathens! <laughs> Uncircumcised heathens! That's what the Bible calls them. But we don't say that anymore. No, we're more seeker-friendly. Hello? We'd rather be seeker-friendly than God-honoring. We would rather tone down the message and tell people where they really are with God. 
Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. Because part of the covenant agreement is if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's part of the covenant agreement. But if you're, if you're just saying, God, forgive me, and you're gonna, you have every intention to go right back out and do the same thing over again, you've broken the covenant. Because the Bible says, if any man says he knows him and continues in sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. You see the covenant agreement there? These, it's so wonderful when you know the covenant agreement. When you make a covenant agreement, you have to keep your, keep your promise. As hard as that can be sometimes. <clears throat> Look at people in the church today getting divorced for stupid reasons. My wife don't cook no more. Well, you got two broken legs? <laughs> Hello? No, but I'm just saying, you know, I just use that as an example. I didn't, no, I'm not singling out anybody. <laughs> well, my wife, my wife don't wash my clothes no more. I'm divorcing her. How stupid is that? Oh, my husband does this, so I'm divorcing him. No, there's another reason. You want to be free. Come on, somebody. Let's look at what Paul said about the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in the church. Romans 11, starting with verse 15 to 24. I'm just going to read this and we'll close. The ethnic principle of, of interpreting the Bible is very important. Let's read it. <clears throat> it says, if the, For if the casting away of them, who's them? Who's them? Come on, somebody talk to me. Who's them? Who's them? Does anybody know who's them? Raise your hand. Nope. 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 But if the casting away of them, the Jews... Right. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Now go to verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Go ahead. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, that's us, were grafted in among them, thank you, Jesus, that's us, we were grafted in among them, with them partake us of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Next verse, please. Boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the root. And don't say you're the root, because you're not the root. You're only the fruit. But you're a part of it. Verse 19. Thou will say then, oh, well, yeah, yeah, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, that's true. Next verse, but don't boast. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. 
Right? When Jesus came and he wanted to receive them, they, they wouldn't take him. They, wouldn't, they didn't want him. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded. Don't get so, so uh, proud and arrogant. But what? But fear. Fear what? Next verse. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. He's talking to Christians. And he's telling them, listen, don't boast about the root. If, if the root was cut off, you know, have fear. But God spared not the natural branches. Take heed lest he also not spare you. Can I tell you that God is not all inclusive? I was listening to a little video clip today of Carlton Pearson. I don't know if you know who Carlton Pearson was, but during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and 2000s, he was a great, great preacher. Who uh, went to ORIU, <coughs> graduated from ORIU, has been the confidant of presidents, been in the White House, preacher, had his church of 5,000, I, I believe, out in California. I believe it was uh, somewhere in Texas, California. I don't remember. And then one day he said he had a revelation from God that there's no hell. Nobody goes to hell. That's universalism. Everybody's going to get saved. Because he can't understand how the Bible can show God as a loving father and allow his children to be in hell. So he believes that there is no hell. He lost everything. But he still preaches that message today. Yes. Yep. Yep, his revelation. Here's, here's, this is all part of interpretation, by the way. When somebody has a revelation, they better give me an explanation. If you have a revelation, I want an explanation. I want to know where you got it from this word. Does it contradict this word? I remember back in 1988, there was some guy who came out. I forgot what his name was. He says, 88 reasons why God is coming in 1988. Anybody remember that? And he gave a specific date. I forget what the date was. Okay, We had friends of ours that believed that, that he, that was going to happen. <clears throat> they said, oh, we're going to get ready. Jesus is coming this day. I said, no, he's not. Right, Linda? I said, no, he's not. The Bible says, for when the, when the hour when you think not, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. I said, no, 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 no. This guy's telling you the day he's coming? I said, he ain't coming that day. I said, if you believe that, give me all your stuff. Give me all your money, all your bank account, 401k, everything. Just empty it out and give it to me. <clears throat> you know what? We're all still here. Jesus said no man knows the day or the hour. See, that's why when you have a, anyone gives you a revelation, quote, unquote, make sure it lines up with the Bible. I've had people say things to me, and you know, I just let it slide off the back of my neck. I just say, you know, a quack. Oh, you're going to be like the Apostle Paul. I don't want to be like the Apostle Paul. Imagine what he went through. You want me to go through what the Apostle Paul went through? Forget it, man. I got enough problem going, you know, following Jesus and going through what he went through. Hello? That's right. It's hard. Christianity isn't easy. It's hard. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If I, if I uh, ask people, are you a follower of Jesus? Uh, everybody raised their hand. Really, are you suffering? You're going through depression, loneliness? He went through all of that. So far that he was in the garden all alone, and all of the disciples ran away from him. When the rubber hit the road and they had to give up their life, 
Except for Peter, of course, you know, Peter took out a sword and cut the guy's ear off. <clears throat> we got to have sword control. Yeah, Jesus should have just had been an advocate for sword control. God help us. Okay, let's continue reading to, to, to verse 24. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee, goodness. If, say if. What's that word if mean? Condition. If you continue in his good while, in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be what? So, see, some people say, well, you're a Christian, you don't have to do nothing. Really? Don't have to do nothing? Well, this tells me you have to do something. For toward thee goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also shall be cut off. I tell you, we have a lazy Christianity today. We have no discipleship. We have no discipline today. First thing, people, they hear a preacher, especially a biblical preacher, someone that's preaching the word, and they get conviction. Oh, the pastor don't love me. I ain't going to that church. The pastor didn't say hello to me Sunday morning. The pastor didn't shake my hand. Come on. People have left churches for that reason. Or if I gave them instruction in something, you know, please don't do that in the sanctuary. I'm not going to church no more. Well, you know what? Fine. You know what that tells me? You can't take instruction or correction. See, this is God's house. It's not your house, not my house. This is God's house. Let me, let me tell you, how would you like it if I, you just spent all day cleaning your house and I went over to your house, I was in my pajamas, I came in and threw my shoes off, you know, sat down in a chair and ate peanuts and threw shells all over the floor. You'd be like, what, what, who do you think you are? What, what are you doing? I just walk in there, go into your fridge, you know, get all anything I want, you know, call up, order all kinds of food and, and just tell them to charge it to you. What, what would you think? You'd say, man, what are you doing? No res thank you. No respect. We don't have respect for people's homes. We don't have respect for God's house. We come in here, we talk about basketball, we talk about football, we talk about we talk about food, everything else. It's like you come into God's house. You should be preparing your heart. You can fellowship afterwards. You can talk to people afterwards. But prepare your heart. You're going to meet God. God's going to show up. Do you understand what I'm saying? Anybody get what I'm saying? I mean, God is going to be here. His presence is going to, his presence is him. I'm not seeking some kind of, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. I'm not trying to seek that. If I'm just seeking, woo -hoo, woo -hoo, ha -ha. I'm not seeking a person. I'm seeking an experience. I don't want to seek an experience. I want to seek God. I want him to manifest. And if, if who, 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 comes and praise the Lord. But I don't worship God just to get the who, 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 who. I don't worship God just to get that. Some people do. But that's not, I'm not supposed to get anything out of worship. Show me in here where people get something out of worship. Who are we worshiping? God. He's supposed to get all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. And if he touches me during that worship and I begin to weep or I begin to get on my knees, that's, a, that's a, the icing on the cake. But I don't worship God to get the icing on the cake. I worship God because of who he is. Come on, somebody. That's good preaching. Hallelujah. We worship God for who he is. 
So I'm going to close that. So when you're, when you're interpreting the Bible, know the three entities that are in there, the, the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. <clears throat> and God has not lost all of those identities. They're still in the scriptures. They're still in the church today. We have Gentiles, which is us, saved, yes. We have Messianic Jews, saved, yes. And we have Gentiles that are not saved. So there are other nations, Jews, and the church. Know who's talking when, when who's talking to who. And take that into consideration when you're interpreting the Bible. Amen? Did that help anybody? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We ask that your blessing be upon your word, upon your people. God, we love you tonight. Lord, we want to exalt you. And you alone, not some form of worship, not some form of music, certainly not some quantum physic worship, devilish, new age, junk, mumbo jumbo. Father, you said they that worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. So, Father, be with us as we go our separate ways, and we thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.